I think the reason why it was so bad in the 70s, like that was a particularly bad stretch for inflation-adjusted returns. And I think a lot of that was the fact that rates came up so high to deal with that inflation. That was a different kind of inflation that we're dealing with today, right? So that was that was bank lending-driven inflation combined with some some fiscal deficits. Uh, there was a big demographics bulge. Plus, you had the energy shortages. You had to rely more on the Middle East for your energy. Uh, U.S. U.S. oil production peaked for a multi-decade stretch starting in 1970, going all the way to the beginning of the shale uh, you know, uh, uh, revolution, uh, you know, several decades later. Uh, and so the fact that rates went up so high put a ton of pressure on valuations. Uh, and so it's natural to think that the rates are, are, are the key thing there. However, if you go back and look at the 1940s, which is which you know uh, uh, viewers will know is the the era that I find more instructive for this environment than the 70s, you had rates stay relatively low even as inflation had these these multiple spikes, these periods of running hot, uh, and and yet there actually still was a growth to value rotation during the 1940s, um, and and that was just a, a a kind of a different era in general. Valuations started and ended that decade lower. Uh, than they are now, uh, because you had all, all the uncertainty around the war. You just came out of a, a very long depression. You're still kind of in the depression in many ways. Uh, and so that was, a, that was a very different era. But the fact is, the point is that despite having high inflation and low yields, you still had somewhat of a rotation. Uh, and, and one way I think we can describe it today is that if, if yields simply stop going down, right? So if they just start going sideways in a, in a, in a macro sense, that takes away a really big headwind. That that is you know pile you know kind of piled into growth equities, and so I would say that you know if if the valuations just kind of stop widening, the fact that value stocks generally pay higher dividend yields, uh, many of them are at average or even mildly below average valuations, um, that that allows for kind of a period of catch up. So if yields don't go up tremendously, it might not be as explosive of a reversal uh, over the longer term. Like you might not have growth stocks do abysmal, you might not have value stocks soar, for example. Uh, and that has implications for the financial sector and things like that. Uh, but you can still have a, a some degree of a growth to value rotation in a more inflationary environment, even if even if yields stay, say, negative real territory. And if they just kind of go sideways or maybe go up a little bit or just kind of keep grinding around at these levels. I think the fact that, you know, if, if, if the 40 year bond bull market is maybe not over, but maybe we're in the pickle, picking nickels up in front of a steamroller phase. Right. So maybe it's we're. we're, we're you know, we're kind of, we squeeze a lot of juice out of that orange. I, I think that's what starts giving us more capability from the value sector. And a lot of it can simply come from the dividends. I mean, if you look at, so so for example, energy pipelines, many of them are paying five, six, seven, eight percent yields that are actually rather sustainable based on, on, on their current fundamentals. Uh, you know, they, they just have to go sideways. And if they go sideways, uh, you know, they can actually outperform a growth stock that goes sideways that pays no dividends, right? So I, I think that's the kind of environment uh, that we might be looking at. As much as I like energy, you know, whenever I see such a positive divergence, you know, the contrarian in me uh, is thinking, you know, once once everyone's on one side of the boat, so you know, I, I get concerned. So I think we can separate time frames. So you know, I, I'm a little bit maybe more cautious on energy here than I was last year, um, while still having a constructive view over the course of the next five, ten years. Um, you know, when I look at other sectors, I, I think defensive value is interesting, uh, and so I think the healthcare sector. Um, uh, you know, especially, you know, there, the, when people think of healthcare these days, they often think of the vaccine plays. That's been a very big theme over the past couple of years. But I'm talking about just other areas of healthcare. So, so pharmaceuticals, insurance, uh, you know, health insurance. I, I think some of those are uh, rather appropriately priced. Uh, some of them pay decent dividends and they have decent growth forecasts. And so overall, I think that's an area uh, that is still, uh, you know, has, has basically good risk reward fundamentals in it. Um, you know, as much as I don't like tobacco stocks, I think some of them are 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 well positioned here. Again, they pay super high yield. They can just go sideways and potentially outperform some of the heavy kind of you know highly valued growth equities out there. Um, and so I, I do think that there are other sectors like that, kind of the defensive value type of categories. Um, when we look at industrials uh, and, and some of this more cyclical value, you know, I think that they could run into some choppiness uh, for a period of time here, at, because we're going through kind of a period of global deceleration from so much stimulus. Uh, we're kind of sorting out what the what the world's going to look like in a year or two, um, and so I'm not necessarily pe- like pounding the table on those, but I do think that those are probably pretty well positioned over the long run as well. So I, I would say, you know, I think that some of some of the even though the energy area might be overdone uh, in terms of enthusiasm, uh, the pipelines, uh, many of them are still uh, below, uh, you know, their price level that they were going into the pandemic. Um, they're less 
they're less concerned with price and more concerned about volumes. Um, and so I think, and, and you know, a lot of them yield six, seven percent or more. And so even if they go sideways for another year, uh, I think that that could do very well compared to the market if the market goes sideways and, and, and pays a lower yield. And so I do like some of the higher quality energy pipeline companies. Um, I also still like, uh, you know, some of the healthcare care uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, you know, either diversify pharmaceuticals or, or, or some of the insurance companies. Um, I, I think those are reasonably attractive in this environment. Um, one of the catalysts there is that um, there was a lot of impending regulation that might have suppressed some of their pricing power. Uh, and that's kind of in doubt right now uh, based on what's happening in Congress. Uh, and then after 2022 uh, midterms, that could be further de-risked. And so the market started to price in kind of a more mild uh, uh, kind of legislation uh, move against them. Uh, and now that might does not have any legislative move against them. So it, it remains to be seen. Um, but I think that there are areas like that that are that are pretty attractive. So I, I'm concerned with some of the mega cap growth. And I think Apple's an interesting one because, I mean, if you look at their, their analysts are expecting single digit growth over the next couple of years. So it, it kind of has, it's like a value stock trading at growth stock valuations. Um, and it's the largest uh, stock in the index. Um, and so I, when I look at mega cap growth, I kind of separate out the different companies. So for example, I'm, I'm not as bearish on Amazon as I am at Apple at the, at the current snapshot in time, for example. Um, so I, I am concerned about some of those, you know, Apple, Costco, uh, you know, uh, maybe Nike, NVIDIA, some, some, of, these, some of these kind of uh, very large cap growth uh, equities that I think have gotten ahead of themselves in terms of valuation. Um, and again, it, you could still even go up and just I think it goes up less than it has been before um, or you could go down quite a bit. And so it's not necessarily a call on direction, more just like a call on I don't like the risk reward ratios of owning a lot of those mega cap growth stocks um, other than maybe on a selective basis. If there's, you know, if one already consolidated for 12 to 18 months, like maybe Amazon has, uh, I'm less concerned about that one than maybe some of the others. Um that might may not be right. So the ARC stocks, you know, they've sold off so aggressively that if anything, they're actually there's there's some that I'm kind of watching for bottoming opportunities. Um, you know, you know, earlier in 2021, you know, Kathy Wood was appearing on magazine covers. Um, everyone was kind of super bullish on ARC. Uh, I was concerned about valuations. Um, when that started to roll over, you know, I kind of got in a little bit too early and, uh, you know, there, there are a couple of growth stocks in there that I picked through and I liked. Um, but I think the more that that whole sector capitulates and people kind of, you know, make fun of ARC, that's actually when I want to start looking at some of their companies. Uh, so I actually do have some of those on my radar uh, for potential bottoming opportunities, um, you know, uh, going forward. So I, I think my biggest area of concern is probably the at least a subset of the mega cap growth stocks. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, one million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke. And you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where do you start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. 
They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof. To the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.